now today uh, look at uh, the constant volume fixed mass reactor we looked at the constant pressure fixed mass reactor earlier we will follow pretty much the same approach um, except that we now notice the volume is going to be fixed and uh, uh, instead the pressure is going to vary and uh, uh, correspondingly the analysis is going to change a little bit and we will let us see how that changes I'm going to go through this a little bit faster when compared to what we did earlier so that uh, we just look at the modifications that we have done uh, that we will do now. So uh, the, the first law of thermodynamics applied here would be uh, to start with we have the same equation but right away we can now say this is equal to 0 because you do not have any PDV work PV work okay and, and nothing else okay so we just say there is no work done by the system uh, we just have only a heat interaction and obviously then any um, change in the internal energy of the system directly comes from the heat or vice versa okay or the heat that is released goes to changing the internal energy directly. So here you now have du over dt equal to q dot divided by m so uh, all heat uh, goes to changing the internal energy because it is constant volume and then um, we, we have a similar situation like what we had before that is we will now say we have a U this is a total specific internal energy um, this is now capital U divided by M this is now total internal energy right. Previously we had a small h is equal to capital H divided by M your instead of that we are now looking at uh, internal energy so this is sigma i equals 1 to n uh, n i capital U i um, divided by M now capital U i is a molar specific molar specific uh, internal energy of uh, species i n i of course uh, continues to be the number of moles of species i so if you are now looking for du over dt right um, so du over dt now changes because of two things one is the number of moles that changes with respect to time as well as the internal energy of species i that changes with respect to time so this is 1 over m sigma i capital U i d n i over d t plus sigma uh, over all i n i d capital U i over d t there are two contributions here again we notice that uh, the molar specific internal energy is a function of uh, temperature alone so for for uh, for gas for for gases therefore dui over dt is equal to at constant volume here dt over dt now this is equal to capital CVI um, dt over dt so this is uh, molar specific heat um, of species I at uh, constant volume now 
we can we can now plug du o dui over dt as cvi dt uh, but then what about dni over dt we can do the same thing as what we did before um, again 1 over v dni over dt equal to uh, omega i so this implies um, dni over dt is equal to v times omega i therefore uh, plugging all these back in the first law that means we say we recognize that du over dt is q dot by m we recognize that the du i over dt is equal to cvi dt and we recognize dni over dt is equal to v omega i we plug all these three back in the original equation and you can now get uh, uh, q, q dot divided by m equal to 1 over m uh, sigma i capital U i omega i uh, times v plus sigma i n i capital C v i d capital T over d small t uh, notice here again as before that v does not have an index i so that is that is a common that is common for all the species and similarly dt over dt is independent of species they can be pulled out of their respective summations so and then m, m gets cancelled uh, for non zero m for those, those of you who are very picky about these so uh, we get q equal to v times sigma uh, capital u i omega i plus dt over dt sigma over i uh, n i capital c v i uh, so from here we can rearrange to get finally I am going to skip a couple of steps which are just algebraic and uh, get this as uh, q dot over v minus sigma over i capital U i omega i divided by sigma over i um, c i capital C v i which I want you to understand is now a function of C v C i and t okay why because omega i depends on C i and temperature and you also have an explicit presence of C i showing up here therefore this is a function of uh, the concentrations and temperature um, of course you can uh, we typically do not deal with uh, uh, specific molar internal energies we typically deal with specific molar enthalpies so you look at these um, tables like Janoff tables and so on it, 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 it typically lists enthalpies rather than internal energies so you could now convert that so for uh, ideal ga ideal gases ideal gases u i equal to h i minus r u uh, t and uh, uh, c v i equals c p i minus r u okay so d t over d t is equal to q dot over v plus r u t sigma i omega i minus sigma over i h i omega i divided by sigma i c i capital C p i minus r u the reason why we are actually having a universal gas constant show up here is because we are dealing with things on a molar basis okay so you would have a specific gas constant only if you are using things on a mass basis therefore uh, this is appropriate I would like to make a few comments we will we will in the future look at these kinds of expressions or terms 
uh, but I want you not to get confused at that time sigma i omega i is non zero primarily because the number of moles in a chemical reaction is not necessarily conserved it is the mass that gets conserved. So if we were to actually look at omega i um, as the amount of mass that is produced per unit volume per unit time okay for which we will assign a symbol w i later on okay then sigma um, over all i of w i will be equal to 0 because you do not have any net mass that is produced or consumed if you now try to sum over all the chemical reactions uh, sorry chemical species that are produced and consumed on their mass basis okay but that is not true when you are now trying to have omega okay keep this in mind because later on we will be looking for a sigma w i and plug it as 0 you should not get confused okay the, the, the English alphabet gives you 0 the Roman does not give you 0 so if you want to quickly remember that way that is also fine Roman is molar English is uh, mass this you can now write h i uh, as h f um, h f not i okay uh, plus sensible enthalpy okay the h f not i times omega i that combination sigma sigma i h f not i omega i will be the net heat release rate in the chemical reaction okay so it is finally coming from the standard heat of formation times the rate at which it is formed for every species added all together is the total heat that is released in the chemical reaction okay so and then the, then then you will have a uh, sensible enthalpy part that that, that that will stay so these things will show up uh, as, as we go along more explicitly we will just don't worry about it now just just uh, so this as before is a function of ci comma t keep that in mind now here since uh, the volume is constant one over v dni over dt is equal to omega i can be directly written as dci over dt is equal to omega i previously we could not do this okay previously we had to notice that ni divided by v is equal to ci and v will change with time so we had two terms for contributing to the rate of change of concentration okay one because of the chemical reactions the other because the pressure was constant the volume was changing and since the volume was changing the concentration was changing but since the volume here is constant we do not have to worry about that effect okay so the concentration changes only due to the chemical reactions here okay or in other words you could take the V directly within the derivative without any effect and uh, get the concentration right there and that is what we are looking for we are looking for a time derivative of concentration as a ODE uh, so this is again a function of uh, C i and T this is because of the um, chemical chemical kinetic equations that we saw earlier on so this is like a fairly large expression for each of those and um, n equations there okay and this is like typically what you would get solved uh, in like with, with, the, with the package like Kimkin okay so you are you uh, advance in time and see what happens but now what we uh, that, that is with a constant temperature but now what you are saying is we will now have this affect the temperature okay and then the temperature will change that is that's essentially the idea that we are talking about and uh, so uh, here dp over dt is of interest as a derived quantity that means we now have these two as a closed set of equations we have n plus 1 equations and n plus 1 unknowns where n unknowns are ci and n equations are these okay so this is the, you should say really this is i equals 1 to n and uh, t is the n plus 1th unknown and uh, this this first equation here is the uh, equation corresponding to that but they are all coupled all of them are coupled uh, so once you do this you should be able to find out dp over dt which is of interest here um, so the way we do this is to go back and say pv is equal to sigma over i 
n i or u t. So, V d p over d t is equal to or u t d by d t of sigma n i plus or u sigma n i d t over d t that means there is a contribution because of change in the number of moles and a contribution in uh, because of change in temperature with respect to time uh, towards uh, rate of change of pressure. So this gives you uh, d p over d t equal to r u t take this v over here right and then get this derivative inside the summation also the volume inside the summation you will now have a sigma of over i 1 over v d n i over d t which is nothing but omega i okay. So this you this gives you a sigma uh, over i omega i plus <coughs> you can pull out the dt over dt from the summation get this volume over here and then that becomes the concentration so you get r u dt over dt sigma c i right so that is that is a function of uh, c i and t which can be evaluated once you have solved for c i and t this is not coupled with the other okay so you can get this. So this this again formulates the constant pressure um, sorry co constant volume um, fixed mass reactor to solve this is not not a joke okay if, if your n is a fairly large number uh, should not say fairly no, should not even say fairly large even if it is modestly large it is going to be complicated uh, you got to pray to pray to your gods that uh, n is like 1 <laughs> okay then then uh, you, you are in decent shape but even then it is it's, 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 it's difficult because this this term here that is showing up here and here is going to be so huge you are going to have the temperature sitting on top of a tree uh, like an exponent to the e uh, minus e over rt there okay um, so that is that, very difficult to handle. There are numerical techniques for these okay so you have to use like some stiff reaction solvers uh, so stiff, stiff equation solvers so uh, there, are, there are special numerical techniques that can handle these simultaneous equations. Uh, so let us now look at uh, the other uh, two ideas that we had on uh, open flow systems so the first of those is the well stirred reactor which is uh, typically abbreviated as WSR it is also called as a perfectly stirred reactor many times okay um, and of course that, that could be uh, abbreviated as PSR and that would that would kind of like rhyme with the next one which is a plug flow reactor abbreviated as PFR so you could think about PSR versus PFR and so on if you do not hear me right then you could get confused between the two so uh, we do not want to get into all that so we will just use WSR okay for the well stirred reactor um, so or uh, perfectly stirred um, reactor I will just use some space below PSR sometimes um, historically it is also uh, referred to as long well reactor uh, because uh, because of the person who came up with this it turns out apparently that uh, Zelda which actually came up with this 10 years earlier in, in Russia. <laughs> So whatever whatever you can think of uh, during the time that Zeldovich lived, you would have done it <laughs> before other people did. That that, that is Zeldovich for you. Uh, he's like a father figure in combustion. So here, uh, what we are talking about is uh, right. So you you have an inlet, and you have an outlet. Uh, and uh, uh, so you have a m dot um, 
i in uh, and, and a corresponding y i in and a uh, h in h i in you can say h i in there is a mass specific uh, enthalpy of species i at the inlet and uh, correspondingly we now uh, say you have a m dot i out um, y i out uh, h i out and so on but all these things of course you now have a control volume that is uh, that you apply within this reactor just pairing the inlet and the outlet okay and uh, consider a q dot that would that would get out of this reactor with a with the with the following characteristics so it has a fixed mass flow mass flow rate so that means sigma mi in is equal to sigma mi out equal to uh, i'm sorry sigma mi dot in uh, equal to sigma mi dot out equal to sigma uh, sorry equal to m dot okay so you have an m dot we didn't use m dot here that's the reason why i was apologetic this is a fixed mass system okay this is a fixed mass flow rate system so when you say fixed mass flow rate implicit in it is that we are looking at steady state you don't have any accumulation of mass or depletion of mass yeah so uh, and then of course you are now looking at the reactor having um, uh, species all species um, with with, uh, with concentrations whose spatial variation we won't worry about okay there is a steady state that means we are not looking at any tempor temporal variations as well that means it is not supposed to vary <laughs> right so if it is not supposed to vary well that means it, 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 you do not you do not have to look for differential equations of evolution of these with respect to either space or time okay but they will depend on parameters what parameters typically we are looking at what is the size of the reactor that you want to work with okay and what is the heat out that you want to get out of this reactor. So de de depending upon these and the input conditions you will get the corresponding output or you will now get the composition inside the reactor and the temperature to attain based on what is the size at which you want to operate this reactor size is given by m dot okay that is like the throughput and what is the heat that you want to get out of this. So these are now like the key parameters in the problem yeah okay so uh, then of course it has a certain temperature pressure and volume okay and of course you could you could uh, ultimately we will see this there is a there is a relationship between these it is like you are you are handling a certain m dot at a certain pressure and volume okay that will relate to a certain density all right and with that density uh, for these mass fractions you will now get um, the partial densities of each of those species to be fixed correspondingly and so on so it's, there, are, there are relationships that we will be working out among these okay so uh, this, this has a uh, an inlet and outlet outlet uh, of for steady stream steady stream of uh, reactants and products respectively that is reactants get into the inlet and products get out of the outlet now when do you get this kind of situation where you do not uh, worry about these details is when you now have high velocity jets of reactants coming in and then getting into like a, a tumble or a, a huge swirl or something of that sort okay so and then finally something that comes out so it is so chaotic inside that you do not want to worry about it right. So uh, experimental reactors. reactors employing uh, high velocity jets okay uh, 
offer this situation ideally okay the interesting thing as we will see is what we are interested in okay we are now looking for algebraic equations without any derivatives right in concentrations and temperature again those are the, those are the ones that we are interested in so the concentrations obviously depend on the reaction rates and the reaction rates depend on what are the reactions so in principle you could actually use a um, reaction scheme of a large set of reactions detailed elementary reaction steps involving whatever species that you are interested in keeping track of that, that, are, that are going to happen in this um, reactor and come out of there right and typically this is good for uh, doing relatively quick I say, I say relatively because it is not quick to start with okay you, you still have like a huge set of algeb nonlinear algebraic equations to solve which is not easy okay. Um, but you are not bothered about the spatial distribution the temporal evolution and all those things you are not really worried about the geometry and all that stuff right. So relatively quickly you can get things like pollutant formations like for example you are interested in NOx okay so you can actually get a fairly good handle of what would be the NOx production from pushing in so much amount of air and so much amount of fuel into a reactor that is going to be operating at this particular pressure this bigger reactor and so on okay or maybe carbon monoxide production why carbon monoxide production let us suppose that you are now trying to push lot of fuel in there and maybe also corresponding amount of fog air okay for complete oxidation but this volume is not good big enough for complete oxidation to happen and before complete oxidation can happen you now have products coming out you are going to be primarily looking at incomplete combustion products right that means you are going to have some carbon monoxide that is a pollutant you see. So you the, the volume available um, is, is going to also constrain how much reaction can happen and therefore you can you can estimate pollutants based on that as well okay. Uh, what we will also see is typically this is used to design uh, reactor sizes like the volumes okay based on another idea of what is called as residence time okay so essentially what happens is you now have a reactor and you want to have a throughput of reactants coming in reacting and producing products and that, that, that go out you want to first of all decide what how big this reactor should be right for this you have to have a notion of what is the residence time of these species inside this reactor by the time they could actually go through all the chemical reactions and come out as complete products. So for complete products we will now use the concept of residence time that will be related to the volume okay so that is that is another way of doing this. The third and very interesting idea uh, that with which you can actually use this this is something uh, like flame blowout all right and how does that work. So it is like let us suppose that I have a uh, I have I have a reactor okay and then uh, I am now trying to pump in more and more and more of the reactants in and at steady state we are now expecting a the same mass flow rate of products out all right and of course for a given volume you are now going to have incomplete combustion progressively but at some stage it is simply not possible for you to combust at all okay as you now throw in more and more reactants at it that makes sense but how are you going to get this out of a model like this the answer is you now have a set of nonlinear algebraic equations that you are looking for which may not have a solution at all for certain values of m dot or q dot okay let us suppose that you are trying to extract a lot of heat out of the system as well you can quench right. So for the set of parameters that you are employing you may actually get into a no solution region 
which which now begins to con, um, correspond to a flame blowout situation. So, yes. Why I is independent of time? Yes, everything is independent of time. What, what reactions are occurring? Reactions are occurring all the time. So whatever you are talking about, everything is happening all the time. That's 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 like a dynamic uh, process. Okay. As you speak, right? You have now reactants coming in, react and produce products or intermediates and products. Everything is happening. So you now. Um, we are not in, we are not bothered about the spatial variation. Okay, so in reality, what might happen is, as you come in, you have more of reactants here, okay, more of intermediates here, and more of products there as they go out. But we are not worried about that that distribution. So if you're not worried about that, you, all you have to say is you have in this reactor for a given uh, set of reactant inputs, right? You are going to get, in fact. The, the, the question that you are asking has to be approximated this way we are looking for this output of products okay but we do not resolve the spatial uh, we do not spatially resolve between somewhere here and somewhere inside okay. So in that sense it is like saying it is all perfectly mixed all right and you are now going to get out these species okay. So it, it is. We, we will try to relate to what we did for the adiabatic flame temperature. Well, while we do this, okay. Except we are now going to be able to parametrically vary things here. So we don't have a spatial variation. We don't have a temporal variation. The difference between the adiabatic flame temperature uh, calculations and what we did earlier for the fixed mass systems, as well as what we will do later on for the for plug flow reactor, is we can track variations between the starting point and the ending point which we did not do earlier okay here we are not doing that so the question is well, how is it different okay the answer is as far as products are concerned we are going to primarily get something like what we did before and they are like they are not exactly equilibrium uh, products but we will get from similar calculations as, 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 we, as we will see okay but we will not do the spatial variation right. So in that sense it is difficult for us to understand how it can be steady state okay but in reality this is what we are expecting to have. So um, okay uh, so no spatial variation uh, no 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 I, I, I meant to say I, I meant to write out something that I got uh, distracted from the let, let's just uh, write out Knox Knox formation incomplete combustion incomplete combustion um, can be quantified um, from combustion efficiency okay so you can find out how much of the original fuel that you put in has been completely oxidized okay so uh, and then that that denotes what's called as combustion efficiency um, so that, that that can quantify incomplete combustion and uh, so you can get that kind of quantity here uh, incomplete combustion and uh, flame blow out okay flame blow out could be studied so considering the complexity of the fluid mechanical process that is happening inside in reality this is a quite powerful idea okay just, just use only algebraic equations to do this it is actually a fairly powerful idea here uh, for uh, these kinds of complicated situations. So now let us let look at uh, the other thing that we, that we said no spatial variation. No spatial variation of uh, concentration or temperature temperature considered considered and uh, steady state assumption okay. 
or steady state assumed okay no time variation no time variation as well okay so this this should lead to algebraic equations as we will see now so global balance for uh, individual species the reason why I am calling it global mass balance is we are not applying it to any particular point in this reactor it is a it is a it is a uh, it is applied to the entire control volume when we want to derive a mass balance for each species we will actually take a control volume approach and do like something like a global balance but we will keep in mind we will now make use of the fact that the control volume is arbitrarily shaped and then we will be able to notice then that the equation that you derive there is actually valid at any, any point but here it is not really valid at any point because you do not have a you do not have any spatial distinction at all okay. So uh, this, is, this is still a certainly a global mass balance so uh, at uh, uh, any uh, at steady state uh, at steady state for uh, each species i m dot i out equal to m dot i in plus omega i times v. Oh, I'm sorry. Make a, made a mistake. We will now use W i. Okay. So this is this is like this is a this is actually like a verbal equation. Okay. We just put in symbols here, but it's it's essentially like a intuitive idea. You think of your bank bank balance, for example. Okay. So this is what you had to start with, and then you put in some some money you get some more some more bank, bank balance right so anything any, anything can be budgeted like this effectively right so whatever you get out is whatever you put in plus what you created this now is actually for a particular species if a species is a reactant and it is going to get uh, uh, consumed this is going to be negative so you are going to get less of it when compared to what, what, what went in so uh, so strictly speaking we should say this is i equals 1 to n and keep in mind this is a dot here that means these are rates so we are looking at something like kilograms per second okay wi then is the okay net rate of production of of mass of species i per unit volume so long as we were dealing with fixed mass systems we were always handling things on a molar basis okay but the moment we are actually shifting to a, a open flow system we, we start dealing with things on a mass basis okay so here instead of using omega i as we did before we use wi so we shift from um, greek to english okay and this is a mass basis and this is what i was trying to point out if you now get a sigma wi you should look for it to be zero because mass is neither created or destroyed totally okay but so long as you have a sigma omega i that's all right wherever because number of moles is not necessarily concerned so so you look at what's going on this is mass produced per rate of mass produced per unit volume so this should be kgs per second meter cubed so times the volume should get you kgs per second okay so these are kgs per second mass mass flow rates okay um, so we know that uh, wi equal to 
omega i times uh, capital W i where capital W i is the molecular weight molecular weight of uh, uh, species i okay the distinction between my w's and omegas is you have this little curly uh, thing for w's whereas that is absent in the omega that's a, so you have to you have to look for that little uh, little thing there okay um, and uh, uh, m dot i equal to m dot times y i and this m dot is the total mass flow rate which is a constant because we have steady state okay and that is a parameter in the problem that that tells you what is the throughput we want to handle in this system okay. So if you now want to uh, put all these things here we get omega i capital W i V plus m dot y i out minus y i in y i out minus y i in equal to 0 i equals 1 to n okay now you could leave it as it is and then say this is given okay this is a parameter that means you can have a set of yi for any m dot okay that means you can send in a particular composition of reactants at any level of mass flow rate you can have a large mass flow rate of the same composition or a small mass flow rate of the same composition yi in for i equals 1 to n will refer to the composition that is sent in m dot will actually refer to the size how much, how much you are trying to push in through this right. So this is given this is what you are trying to look for okay now since we do not make a distinction between here 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 and here we do not have a spatial variation that is possible okay what we are looking for is only mainly what is happening inside as like a whole uh, quantity right and therefore you can, you can say because you have to bring in the volume and so on you now say yi out is the same as whatever is the yi inside the control volume because you just cannot make the distinction okay especially so uh, here we suppose right y um y i out is identically the same as y i c v where y i c v stands for the um, composition in the control volume okay and of course keep in mind this omega i is going to be a function of concentration of individual species and temperature so temperature is coming into picture here and we do not know that right so for that we need to solve the global energy balance so you get one more equation for that unknown and that is what we should be pursuing okay so global energy balance Q dot is equal to I equals 1 to n m dot I out h i t out minus sigma I equals 1 to n m dot I in h i t in okay so let us let us just go back and write y i c v as simply 
yi let us not have any subscripts anymore for what we want to calculate uh, anything that we want we try to not have subscripts superscripts primes and all that stuff that should be like the uh, main quantity. So here what is happening is this is the product enthalpy uh, enthalpy rate I, 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 I stand corrected this is the rate at which enthalpy is coming out okay this is the rate at which the enthalpy is going in the reason why we have a rate is because we now have an m dot the dot is what is making it a rate okay and uh, this is beginning to look like what we did earlier okay so when you did the uh, adiabatic flame temperature calculations we were looking at energy not the energy rate right not the power rather so here you're looking at q dot previously we said q and for adiabatic flame temperature calculations we said we set q is equal to 0 and then equated the product enthalpy not the enthalpy rate equal to the the reactant enthalpy okay and then we tried to find out the t out which is what we are going to do now as well all right so it is it's, it's an algebraic equation that we had earlier which is also same thing as what we are doing here you see except the m dot i out was calculated based on equilibrium calculations earlier on whereas here m dot i out is nothing but m dot times yi out and yi is going to be now calculated with this equation taking into account the chemical kinetics so this is a difference so this is the real process that was a hypothetical process you see so here um, um, so you want to now say this is a parameter and uh, this is what we want to try to find out and we suppose uh, T out is uh, equivalent to uh, identically equivalent to TCV which is the temperature in the control volume because we cannot distinguish and that would be equal to C this is given you might argue with me that wait a minute we cannot we cannot distinguish between here and here as well okay do not do not do not do not ask that question okay that is essentially the point we are not really doing anything bad strictly speaking this is out that is okay okay this balance is correct we just drop this drop the subscript that is it okay um, and, and uh, so Q dot is equal to we can now pull the m dot out sigma i equals 1 to n y i h i of t minus sigma i equals 1 to n y i in h i of t n so here y i n is also given as as we said earlier um, at least we need to know the inlet composition and uh, recall h i h i of t is equal to h of not uh, sorry h of not i plus integral t ref to t small c p i d t okay so we are we are writing everything in small it is small h here small h here small cp okay this is because this is on a mass basis the capital cp that we wrote earlier for the fixed mass reactors is on a molar basis okay so we now have two equations and two unknowns we will pursue this a little bit more um, tomorrow this is this is a good time to stop because we are now looking at the picture Okay, we will now do some finishing touches tomorrow and then proceed with the plug flow reactor yeah. thank you.